few questions uh, that I got via email, and I thought I would um, just create a quick video to maybe address those questions, and uh, maybe other people have the same questions. Um, and so maybe we'll knock them all off at one time. Um, it's regarding the use of Thani, and um, uh, in particular in functions. So I, I'm sure that many of you have noticed that it's very, very similar in usage, uh, this, this uh, IDE, very similar in usage to uh, Dr. Racket. Uh, but I'll, I'll just be a little more kind of explicit or show you um, what I mean by that and, and how functions work in this software or just an example of my own software. So I will switch over to Thani and we will continue. Um, I've got these couple of functions that I've put together here. Uh, and so let's just talk about them a little bit. Uh, you know, we had the two screens just like in Dr. Racket. The top screen is what gets saved when we save things. The bottom screen is, is something that I can just kind of uh, throw together. So right now this bottom screen, does, it's just got some stuff that's messing around. So let's just get rid of it. Okay. Here's the definition. Remember in Dr. Steen, we would use the word define. And here's another definition. In Python, we're just going to use def as the keyword. The keyword is def. Now, this word my function, my underscore function one, is a function that I'm creating. That's my name. I made that up. That I could make that anything I want. So I called this one my function one. But it specifies it as being a function, though. Uh, in Python and in, in uh, Dr. Racket is these parentheses. They're, they're special. They make it unique, not a variable. In Dr. Racket, that is. In Python, we don't need uh, def for variables. But in Python, I'm sorry, in Dr. Racket, we did in Scheme. We used the keyword define for both functions and variables. And so the way the machine was able to know the difference between a function and a variable was specifically because of these parentheses, right? And now in, in, in both languages, if we wanted to define an argument that this function was going to receive what it was called, right, some value we want to send to this function, we would place it right in between those parentheses. Uh, the variable name, right? And then we could use the variable down in the body of the function. Right? So this function, and uh, Python in particular, we want to be very careful about indentation. It, can, it means a lot to this function. Right? So all the indented <coughs> lines under the function are controlled by the function. So the s machine knows, <coughs> the compiler or interpreter here, knows that we're finished with the function when the indentation stops. And so that's how it's, that's how it's identifying what lines of code belong to the function called, in this case, my function, a name that I made up myself. Now, this is also very important to not forget that colon. It, that signifies that the function signature is finished. This whole, this whole thing is the function signature, it would be the name of the function and the arguments that it takes. Right? So you would think that it could be finished at the end of the parenthesis, but it's, it's really not. Not until it gets to the, the colon then the interpreter knows, okay, we're finished with the signature of this function. Now let's see what the code being executed by this function is. Right? And so one thing to be aware of, uh, it's probably, it's been implied so far, I think, but um, I'll just explicitly state that the flow of execution within a program is top-down, left-to-right, of course, and sequential. So one after the other, top down, from left to right. That's the way it wants to, ex it wants to execute. So there are ways for us to modify or change that flow of execution, but by default, it's always going to want to do one line after the other, like that, top to bottom. Right? So this is just a definition. So nothing's actually executing here. We're saying to the interpreter, Listen, if someone uses this word, my function one, I'm calling it one word, right? Because there's no spaces. We don't want any spaces in the name of something. 
So my underscore function one is a word now that exists in the dictionary of this software, of, of, of uh, Thani. And so if I ever I use that word, the interpreter will know what I'm talking about. Right? And I've done it again here. I've created another function. So I've made them different by calling one of them. I put a one on the end of one and a two on the end of the other one. Right? Neither one of them have any arguments. So when I make a, when I make a call to these functions from somewhere, I'm not going to pass anything to it. Right? So there's, there's, there's nothing being sent to this function. It could be, still be called. That doesn't mean it can't be called. But it's, uh, it's not going to receive anything when it gets called. And so then the, the only line of code that's going to run, it only has one, right? Both of them only have one line of code. And that's just the print function. And the print function we know takes a string, as we saw in our last one. So this is a string. We know it's a string because it's wrapped in quotes, right? Just like in Dr. Agate, just like in Scheme. The print function, that, that's the input argument to the, to the print function is a built-in function, as opposed to my function one, which is a user-defined function, right? That's not built in. My function one is not built in. I made that up. I'm making this up. So one thing to note there, though, is that a, a function that you create, or let's just be very general about it, because it's a very general concept, um, a function can call another function, right? And I'll, I'll show an example of that uh, in a moment as well. But this is an example, really. This is the my function one function, user defined function, calling the built in function print. And it's sending print one argument. And that argument is a string. And that string is hello from function one. All right? And same, same setup for function two. So I've got two separate functions defined here. And now this is what a call looks like. Notice that it does not have the word def, right? And there, uh, it's, it's matching, right? Uh, the, the same name is the one I'm trying to call. That's the name of the function I'm trying to call. Now, if, if this function was defined to accept an argument, then I would have to put an argument here, right? So I, I have to have a matching. <coughs> My function too, this is what the call looks like. <coughs> I just use the name of the function. And, I, I, and, and the parentheses, which may contain no arguments or may contain arguments, depending on the definition. Right? So there we have, uh, there's the call to my function, and the call one, and the call to my function two. If I go ahead and run this, then we'll see the bottom screen, hello from function one, hello from function two. Because first this one was called, line eight, my function one was called, so this this function was called and began executing, and the only line of code it has to execute is this particular line, line two. So it completed, and then my function two was the next thing that needed to happen. So then we go up to my function two, say, aha, here it is. It's getting no arguments. There should be nothing sent to it. And there's only one line of code here that needs to execute. It's line six, the print. The print is called. The, the built-in print function is called. The string hello from function two is sent to it. And print always just prints out to the output whatever it's sent. Now we notice in the last exercise that here in Python, we can, it doesn't have to be a, a string. We can also send a number here, right? That would work just as well. Let's do this real quick. So I can I'll show you what's happening there. So I'm just sending it the number five rather than a, str uh, a string. And so it printed in the output the number five. So print, the built-in function print, knows how to handle whatever it is you're sending to it. Right? And in the last exercise, what we noticed was if we start performing operations in here, arithmetic operations, um, like this, uh, just like my dear Aunt Sally, he, he learned in algebra, things inside of parentheses have to happen before things outside of parentheses. So the, the, the call to print, the argument that's being sent is not known 
until the arithmetic operation plus the sum is handled. And then we'll know what the argument is to send it to print. So the inside of the parentheses has to happen first. So we should be, in this case, we should be sending print 7. And out pops us out. All right, so let's see if I did this right. Then I still have this. Yep, okay. So hello from function one. I made a call. Hello from function two. That's a call. Notice there's no semicolon at the, or no colon at the end of that. The colon only exists in the definition. All right, and we'll just make sure we're back to where we want to be. Now, I, I mentioned that I can call a function from a function. So let's try to call, and we see that in, in function one, we are actually, and function two, we're calling a function from the function, right? Because we're calling the print function from that function. But let's just add another one. Let's do it this way. We're going to call my function two from my function one, right? So this single call here, I expect now to have a call, I expect to have the same output, right? The first one, when this call happens, this line will execute, line two will execute, and then, so that will print hello from function one, and then this line will execute, which is, a, is itself a call to this function, which will cause this line to execute. Right, and then once that's finished, we return here, all right, and that, that's that's over. So then what winds up happening is we, we hit the end of the function. So it's over. Right? So it's top down, one after the other. It's in se sequential. It'll do this one, and then this one. It'll do line. Line one is the call. Well, line nine is the call, beginning at line one. The function begins. So line two executes, and then line three executes. clear up a few of the questions that we that I got by an email and maybe it helps to make things a little easier. Now oh, let me let me show you one more thing there because it is possible for me to run this. I could do this. Uh, right, I'm not going to put my call in the top window but rather in the bottom window. So here I'm calling my function one. Now I'm only doing this because I'm trying to show you that it's, everything's working here the same as Dr. Scheme, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Racket. Uh, it's just that the, the language is a little different. So, uh, yeah, we, what, what we notice is that the language here, I'm going to actually prove that a little bit more, both to myself and to you. We'll do that, and then call a function one. So there we go. We got, we got the, the call from uh, the, the, the output from function one and the output from function two. All from a call to function one, because function one makes a call to function two. All right, so that is about that. So I'm hoping that you guys are noticing how similar these are. Uh, there are always nuances between languages. The reason there are different languages is because people do different things when they build them. They have different expectations or, or things that they want to improve upon or change. Um, and, and those nuances, you, they're, you're really, they're not, it's unlikely that you'll understand why the, the nuances are there until you've worked with a language for some time. 
Um, initially, it's just syntax issues. So it, it, it kind of feels different, and then maybe one would wonder, why is this different? Well, that why part <laughs> is not going to be quite so obvious until you, you, you become more deeply embedded in that in the particular language that you're using. Uh, oftentimes, it's just the syntax that we're, that we're learning from the start. Um, but what you're going to notice is, and what I tried to point out in our last exercise, although there was no video, it was only a write up, uh, is the similarities um, that you have between languages. And so they all have particular structures, control structures of sorts. And those are usual control structures are used to uh, circumnavigate, let's say, the uh, top down sequential execution or flow of execution. Of, of the instructions in the program. Uh, and, and so we can, we can kind of expect in all languages that there's going to be some kind of way to do that. So once you start to become aware of that, and you, you know, okay, there's got to be some way to have a selection structure in this language. So it might be called if, it might have else's, it may not. The particular syntax of the language, like what words are they going to use? Some say if, and then elif, elif, all right? Some say different things, the words say different things, but they all work the same way. They're always the same thing. It's a condition that's going to be true or false. There's a body of code, maybe it needs um, um, curly brackets around that body of code. In this case with Python, it needs um, indentation. There's always going to be nuances between the languages, but the general concept is going to be the same. Whether we're working in Perl or C or C++ or Java or Python or Scheme or Lisp, they all conceptually are, are almost the same. The hard part is always, uh, the hardest part is trying to figure out how to solve a particular problem in the first place. And most times, many times, People are not focused in any way on a language so much, right? In fact, there's something called pseudocode, which is a very generic term. It just means I'm not using any particular code. It's code-like, but I'm kind of making it up as I go because I'm trying to just structure my, my solution. I'm trying to put together the ideas, kind of an outline of these are the things I would need to have happen to solve this problem. That is the hard part. How do I solve the problem in the first place, regardless of what language I'm going to implement that solution in? If I don't understand how to solve the problem, it doesn't matter the language, right? The matter that the language is irrelevant if you can't solve the problem in the first place. And I'll, I'll give a, a little simple example of that is we want to, let's say we want to uh, produce a function, maybe we'll do something like this. We want to produce a function that, um, when given uh, an, an integer, so 6, 2, 3, 8, something like that, um, the function will respond by saying, by telling us, informing the user, whoever called, uh, whether that number that was sent to the function is, a pop, uh, is an even number or an odd number. Okay. So this is a, a problem that I can, I can implement the solution in any language, any language on the face of the planet. But how do I solve that problem? I could know 35 languages. And if I can't figure out how to solve that problem, it doesn't matter if I know 700 languages. <laughs> the problem itself is where the difficulty is. How do I solve that problem? So you're going to see that as we go. Um, uh, just knowing a language doesn't solve the problem for you. Right? Just knowing algebra doesn't mean you can solve an algebraic problem. I mean, you get the problem and you still have to figure out how to solve the problem. You just don't know how to manipulate the algebra. Um, so it's similar in, in nature to that. And so, that's what we've been kind of learning uh, in, in whether it's Dr. Scheme or Python or C or C++ or Java, it's always going to be about problem solving. 
because that's computer science. Solving problem. Everything's a problem when we're trying to solve it. If, if you're not trying to solve a problem, then actually you don't really need to hire me. Right? That's why I'm hired, because I've got some problem that I don't know how to solve. And there has not been any. If there was code written for this problem already, I would just buy the code. I don't need to hire somebody to rewrite code that's already written. So these problems are typically, in the real world, these problems don't have a solution yet. Right? You are the first person creating the solution. So there is no one to go ask, what's the solution to this? If there was, the person would just <laughs> sell the software and, and keep the money, and you're, you're unnecessary. Right? So it's always, you're always in the dark. You don't know how to solve the problem. You don't know what language to use. Right? Different languages are good at solving, or, or, or better, or more useful for solving particular problems. If you're doing text searches and things like that, for instance, this is just an example, um, then you might want to use Perl because you, you get the, to use just built-in regular expressions usage. Which could be really useful in, in doing text or, or character processing. So we might want to use that language because of that feature that it has. But it still has a while loop. It still has an if. It still has a for loop. It still has a way to define functions. It still has variables. All of the same things it has, but then it has its own unique features, uh, uh, features as well. Okay. So hopefully that helps uh, understand, helps you guys understand a little bit about just programming languages in general and um, and how Python is really related. They're all related, really. <laughs> They're all kind of related. So the big picture is not learning necessarily, learning a language, although you do need to get accustomed to the syntax. The syntax can be problematic. It really can. It's just not the worst problem. <laughs> the worst problem is how do I solve the problem in the first place? All right, so I think that's going to wrap this little video up here. It turned into a long video, but I didn't, I didn't mean that happen. So my next one, I, I've got a bit of a write-up already. We're gonna, we're gonna, we just worked with um, selection structure, and I did that intentionally because we had already done um, selection structure in Scheme. So we're just, I'm just showing, uh, I, I just wanted to kick right off with Python right where we left off scheme and just to kind of show that uh, there's a selection structure in scheme <laughs> in, in Python that's very similar to the, the one in scheme, which is very similar to the one in C, which is very similar to the one in C++, Java, Perl, Ruby. <laughs> all of them, they all have a selection structure. They all have a repetition structure, which we're going to move into next. There's two main ways to do that, uh, really generic ways. You can do it through recursion, which Scheme would use, or we could do it through um, some sort of repetition structure, uh, which is the way many other languages do it. Um, both languages, Scheme and other languages, are able or capable of, of performing uh, repetition in either of those two general methods, either using some sort of a repetition structure or um, um, recursion. Scheme programmers would prefer recursion. Um, Python, C, C++, etc. would prefer, I don't want to say prefer, but often, often use a repetition structure. And so we're, we're going to talk next about repetition structures. And um, that will be, I'm going to work on the video now. I have a, a write-up already written up. So next is can I get the video done quickly? <laughs> All right, I'll see you in the next one.